Hello and welcome. Uh, the number of cases uh, of uh, COVID-19 in India has now uh, crossed or almost crossed 6,000 and the number of deaths is rising as well. Uh, as, we, as we follow those numbers and hope that the curve flattens sooner than later, the other thing we're trying to understand obviously is what causes uh, uh, this kind of damage. And the lung is pretty much, uh, to use a pun, at the heart of the problem. And uh, to understand that, I am uh, understand that better, I'm joined by a renowned expert in the field, uh, Dr. Sanjay Mukhopadhyay. He's the director of pulmonary pathology at the Cleveland Clinic. He was earlier a surgical pathologist and a, is also a leader in the global pathology education in social media. Uh, Dr. Mukhopadhyay, thank you very much for joining us uh, from Cleveland in, uh, in Ohio. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So great. So let me start off with a with a straight question. So why is the lung the target of the COVID-19 virus and how does that really play out as the infection, uh, you know, attacks an individual and then progresses? You know, the uh, SARS coronavirus 2, which is causing the uh, global pandemic right now, is a part of a family of coronaviruses, as you know. And the coronaviruses, both this one and the earlier one, the SARS-CoV-1, the, the one that caused the original SARS epidemic before this, both of them sort of attached to cells by a, almost what you can think of as, as a lock and key mechanism. Mm -hmm. So the virus is actually trying to use its key to open the lock in a variety of different cells. Mm -hmm. And it just happens to be that both SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2 have found a um, a lock that they can that they have the key to so uh, that that lock is called a receptor in medical terminology mm -hmm. so there are receptors that do normal things in normal cells in the body they have normal functions but the virus exploits those receptors to to enter the body so it for the SARS-CoV-2 the receptor happens to be mm -hmm. on cells that are in the back of your um, throat mm -hmm. on the back of your nose that's called the nasopharynx Mm -hmm. So the virus goes and attacks, attaches there. Mm -hmm. It goes and attaches there. And viruses, as you know, they can't replicate on their own. They can't divide. They can't make babies. So they need to go inside a cell and then they use the cell's machinery to replicate. So what they, what the SARS-CoV-2 virus is, does, it, it goes inside the cells. We call them epithelial cells in medical jargon. They go inside the cells of the back of your um, nasopharynx and then they travel down infecting cells in their way all the way to the lung. So the uh, short answer to your question is because those receptors that the SARS-CoV-2 uses mm -hmm. are in those cells, it attaches mm -hmm. to those cells. The receptor is actually called ACE2, A-C-E-2. Right. So, uh, so and I'm going to come back to the lung in a moment. But tell me, uh, since you described the path of the virus, how is it that in, then uh, it spreads from one person to the other? Yeah, so, you know, what happens is, so when this virus is attacking the body, it's actually getting into a cell. Mm -hmm. But when you sneeze or cough, the virus is actually being expelled out of the body in what's known as a, a droplet, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's out there in the air and it hangs out in the air and then drops to a surface. Mm -hmm. So the surfaces that you are, and people have done experiments on this in the very early days of the pandemic. They have seen that if, they, if the virus lands on hard surfaces, uh, you know, like a like a metallic surface, it lingers on there, can linger for as long as a couple of days. Mm -hmm. And then if you touch that surface and then that surface touches your mouth or eyes or, you know, then you can transmit that droplet to yourself. This is a little different than a virus that lingers in the air for a long time. Mm -hmm. And then you can inhale it from the air. That seems to be not as important for this one as actually falling down to a surface and then you take, you know, get it from the surface. Right. And I'm sorry to, to go a little further into that. How does it then survive on a surface uh, for so long? Yeah, you know, the, I'm not sure what the mechanisms are, but viruses can stay, you know, extracellularly, like outside the cell. They can survive for a little while before they just die off on their own. So this, mm -hmm. uh, the experiment showed that the, that time period is about two or three days. Mm -hmm. But uh, why exactly it does, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know what the mechanism is. Okay. So now uh, you did this very interesting and uh, early study uh, on uh, where you looked at patients from Wuhan. And uh, one of your conclusions was that uh, 50 of those 54 patients died because they had uh, ARDS or acute respiratory disease syndrome. And uh, that is, is, is really how the disease progresses to become lethal. So tell us about that and why uh, we, wherever we are, should be worried about that. 
Yes, so just to clarify, Govind, the, uh, you know, th that was not my study. It was just a, a study that was done by Chinese researchers sure, sure. in Wuhan. And mm. I was just analyzing it for the purpose of the audience, trying to explain what was happening. Okay. But you're, you're completely right. So the people in that study were all hospitalized. So these are the severe end of the uh, infection. They're not people who are at home with mild symptoms. These mm -hmm. are severely affected. So they looked at the people who were in the hospital Mm -hmm. And of the patients who were in the hospital, those who developed ARDS were mm -hmm. much more likely to die. And what mm -hmm. ARDS means, it stands for Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. That's mm -hmm. what the ARDS is. Mm -hmm. And what happens is as the virus goes down into the lungs, it causes the little blood vessels. You know, you can think of them as the smallest branches of the arteries. It causes them to become leaky and it damages all the alveoli, the you know little air sacs that are in the lung. And that kind of damage, if you look at it on a chest X-ray or a chest CT, mm. it makes a normal CT or X-ray, which is black because there's all air inside it. It makes mm. it turn completely white on mm. both sides. Mm -hmm. And that is happening in at least some patients with um, in the pandemic. Mm. It is happening to those patients. And the patients that develop ARDS are the ones who are on the ventilator. And mm. those tend to have a very bad outcome. Mm -hmm. right. They tend and to be the ones who don't survive. Right, and and uh, uh, and the ARDS is really uh, and and there are sim sim and and is is the ARDS also the reason why uh, hospitals are only admitting uh, COVID patients because they are likely to have ARDS? Well, the hospitals are admitting people who have symptoms to the point that they cannot you know they cannot survive out in the community. Mm -hmm. So yes, they, they are admitting people who are who have severe symptoms. Mm -hmm. And some of them, the ones who develop ARDS, who get very, very short of breath, mm. those are the people that need to be on a ventilator. So the point of being on a ventilator is not that the ventilator is curing the patient. Mm. It's just that without the ventilator, they won't be able to breathe. So that wall of the alveolus is so damaged with the mm. ARDS that without a ventilator, those patients will die. So they need ventilatory support. You are literally pushing oxygen into their lungs, which mm -hmm. otherwise wouldn't go. Right, and and on the flip side, uh, if if you are feeling breathless and uh, and or you have low oxygen, which I'm sure you cannot self-diagnose, but the breathlessness you can, uh, that means you uh, you could very well be having uh, an advanced uh, stage uh, uh, condition of COVID-19. That's exactly right. That's that's a very good point you brought up. Actually, what I would say is one thing you should put out in the out there is. People who were previously well mm -hmm. and then have fever, cough, it's okay, you know, to to perhaps self-quarantine. But if you get severely short of breath, you must seek medical attention. That might be a sign that you're, you know, developing the later stages of the disease. Right. And, and uh, you know, uh, since the lung is really what is collapsing here and uh, and it, it leads to or leads to uh, the need for ventilator support, and I'll come to that in a moment. Can we can we then strengthen the lung in some way? Can I be, uh, you know, you normally you say, OK, I take vitamin C and I become more immune uh, and you're welcome to counter that. Uh, but is, is the is the lung also something that can be strengthened? No, Govind, there's nothing that I, I'm not I'm not aware of any like magic uh, way to do it. Right. The, so that is why, you know, because there is no way to protect yourself from this, mm -hmm. that's why social distancing is so important. You want to prevent the infection in mm -hmm. the first place, because once you're infected, there's really nothing you can do to decide whether you go into the mild path or the severe path. Mm -hmm. You know, we just don't know how to predict who will get it. We, we do know, though, from studies that have happened in multiple places. I was just reading one from the state of Washington in the United States. Mm -hmm. They did a, a very well done study on nursing home, uh, you know, long term care facility people who got the infection. Mm -hmm. So of the people who were tested there, you know, they were all sick elderly people. The median age was about 83. Right. Mm -hmm. And all of them had underlying conditions, hypertension, heart disease of those, the ones uh, who were long term care facility residents, almost all of them who were tested had the disease and a large proportion of them died. Almost 33 percent of them died of the disease. Mm -hmm. But when they looked at the, uh, the, the staff who were taking care of them, some of them also got infected, but none of them died because they were younger and were healthier to begin with. Mm -hmm. So that's very well known now that if you are young and healthy to yeah. begin with, mm -hmm. your chances of dying are, are lower than those who are elderly and, and immunocompromised or who have an underlying condition. So mm -hmm. you want to keep the infection especially away from those people mm. um, 
because they are at most at risk. So, so age, of course, I mean, and all the data seems to be showing that. So it's not like, for instance, if I'm a sports person and my, obviously I have stronger lungs or I have better breathing capacity, or if I'm a diver, I can hold my breath. So all that does not mean that I am more immune to a uh, attack on my lungs uh, the way COVID does. Yes, so there's a distinction to be made here. Mm. You are not at all immune from getting infected, right? Yeah, so no yeah. question about that. You, you you can get infected and people are getting infected at all, at all ages. But it does seem to be that once you do get infected, how your health was to begin with determines how you will do later on. That's right. really the right. main difference. Right. Okay, so let's come to ventilators now. You did say that, you know, ventilator is really, uh, it because your lungs are uh, in a, uh, unable to perform, uh, I mean, you and, and you really have to give uh, or provide ventilator support. Now, uh, at what stage uh, are the lungs and is your, is the body in general? Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and really do, uh, do ventilators help? I mean, I know they do. But uh, is it, are you already at a pretty, uh, you know, at the last mile, so to speak, uh, and because of which maybe uh, the chances are bleak? Yes, that's a, that's a very good question. You know, you, so the answer is yes. Mm. You are, by the time you need a ventilator, you are already at a pretty advanced stage in the mm. disease, mm -hmm. which is why once you get on a ventilator, the earlier you recover, you know, the ventilator is not curing you. It's just giving you time while the body is fighting back the infection. Mm -hmm. So the, the earlier on the ventilator, you, your body fights off the infection and you're able to recover, the more the chances that you will actually recover from the mm -hmm. disease. So there mm -hmm. are there is a percentage of patients who will recover, go back to the rest, you know regular hospital ward or be discharged home. There are people who are recovering, but that is a relatively small fraction. Now, the more and more you stay on the ventilator, so if it's one week, greater than one week, so the more further out you get, the less be become the chances that you will actually get off of it. Yeah. So the time is a critical factor here, you know? Yeah. And is that because the body, I mean, the, there are other organs which are also failing in the body, particularly for older people? Yes, correct. Other organs are also failing and the lungs are getting more and more damaged. And the walls of the lung, which should, which should be very thin, you know, so oxygen can go back and forth. Mm. Those walls are gradually getting thicker and thicker and creating more of a barrier for the oxygen to go into the bloodstream. Right. And, uh, you know, there are many treatment paths that are being followed right now. Uh, uh, I mean, there's a lot of debate and discussion about it as well. I mean, I've been talking to a lot of doctors in India. Uh, some of them are using antiretrovirals plus uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine and other things. And they feel that, I mean, one is they don't have any option and that seems to be uh, doing the job for now. But how are you seeing uh, the, the different treatment paths from your vantage point? Yeah, let me give you a full disclaimer here, Govin. I'm a pathologist. I'm a lung pathologist. So and, and a surgeon. I do have expertise in looking at the lung tissue, yeah. but I'm actually not seeing any patients directly in the ICU. Sure. So I, do, I, I would like to stay out of the treatment um, controversies sure. because that's not, you know, that's not something I have direct expertise with. Fair enough. So I'll okay. defer on that question. Sure, absolutely. So, uh, uh, you know, if, if you look at what the, the data and the numbers now uh, in the United States, I mean, since you're there now, uh, what what are the conclusions that you've drawn and which are in some ways or if in any ways different from maybe what they were even two or three weeks ago? And uh, what's your sense going forward? Yeah, one thing that we are realizing now, and it, it's just early days, Govind, so I don't want to yeah. go too far with this. But what we're realizing is that this, you know, various states had various levels of um, response to this um, yeah. coronavirus and different people started their social distancing at different time periods mm -hmm. and with different levels of aggressiveness. But it seems that the people who were very aggressive about social distancing mm -hmm. and where the population, the people of the state mm -hmm. complied with the social distancing regulations, those people are actually seeing a little bit of a uh, flattening of the curve. In mm -hmm. other words, that it is working. Mm. It seems to be working. Mm. So I'm being cautious about this because, because we don't sure. have all the data yet, but it does seem that if you stay at home and comply with the regulations to social distance, it mm. does make a difference. So we are beginning to see the, the initial hints of that in the data from the United States. Right. And in any, uh, has, uh, is the data so far uh, giving you any better understanding of this disease or in the way it's uh, affecting uh, humans or the way, let's say, it's causing a certain degree of casualty or is it more or less or is it broadly, are you, are you understanding it is really my question? 
Yes, you know, one thing we have understood, Govind, which I initially actually um, it didn't quite make sense why this virus was any different than influenza or, or any of the mm -hmm. others. But the way I would like to explain it is, you know, you have a, as a virus, you have two things that are, are critical. One is how easy is it to take it from one person to the other, infectiousness. Mm -hmm. And then the other is how lethal is it when it does infect somebody. Mm. Right. So the, the viruses that were the most lethal, let's take take the example of MERS. Mm. The the moment it infected somebody, those people were killed at, at a high proportion of cases. Mm. So they never really had a chance to be infectious to other people. Mm. So if you are that level of lethalness, you it never spreads. And the, mm. the infection sort of dies out on its own because it kills the people that it infects. Mm. So that's one end. The other end is like your coronaviruses that cause the normal common cold. Mm. So it's very infectious. It goes from person to person, but it doesn't kill too many people. So mm. it's not that much of a problem in the community. Mm -hmm. So SARS coronavirus 2 is sort of in the middle of those two extremes. Mm. So the people who are infected are asymptomatic for a while. So they're moving around infecting other people. And then as opposed to the common cold, seven days later or so, people start getting symptoms and and the vi virus becomes lethal. So it's now very well established that it's because coronavirus behaves in this way, SARS coronavirus 2, it is both infectious and lethal. And that's why it's causing this. You know, we are beginning to understand why it occupies this unique position among viruses. Right. So, and last and perhaps maybe an early question, but, uh, you know, while we look for a vaccine and maybe we'll find it uh, in coming months or years, but uh, is there something that people, uh, you know, life, lives and lifestyles will change, but uh, is there anything that you would specifically recommend and your advice to those who are or will watch this? Yeah, well, my recommendation is that it, it is, um, you know, keep an open mind. It's okay to be skeptical. It's okay to read everything that you read. But um, in terms of reacting, you can take two paths. You can say, well, I don't care and I'll I'll just do whatever I want. And the other is to be over cautious and be, you know, stay at home, follow all the recommendations. I would say my recommendation would be be over cautious. Mm -hmm. If it turns out that, um, uh, you know, some of the things are wrong and what you're, you lose nothing. You know, you protect yourself and your family and the people who are vulnerable. So my recommendation will be be over cautious, follow the social distancing guidelines, don't uh, uh, gather together in large crowds and your family, your elders, your parents will all thank you in the long run for that. Right. Uh, uh, Dr. Sanjay Mukhopadhyay, thank you very much for joining us and I wish you uh, all the best from everyone here in your efforts to understand this uh, virus better and uh, contribute to the war against it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you for having me on. Thank you.